Willkommen, bienvenidos, welcome, bienvenuti, bienvenu, etc., etc. Um, we will start with a little video. I and all my colleagues who helped organize this conference, and especially the producers, are very proud of. So please enjoy. The common When a time for an idea has come, then there will be a large number of people who will start identifying with that idea. And uh, I would submit that the time for a commons movement has come. The concept of the common, the common, the community, in tant que ce que l'on partage, in tant que le partage est effectivement le lieu ou la relation qui fait de nous des êtres humains et que euh, il en découle l'obligation de sanctuariser la relation humaine, ou disons ce qu'elle a euh, de partage, que cela constitue peut-être une utopie euh, autour de laquelle il nous faut euh, réfléchir de manière neuve. Cette réunion, je crois que a été une photographie de comment nous sommes, un balance, un connaissement mutuo, un établir temas claves y creo que es una base para el futuro. No, no tenemos conclusiones. On commence par ce qu'on a à faire. Que chacun fasse aujourd'hui un travail de construction des communs et on, on va arriver à les coordonner. Et s'il y a une chose qu'il nous faut défendre aujourd'hui, c'est la capacité de coordination. On a quand même une difficulté à identifier ce que j'appelle les points durs euh, ou les angles morts sur lesquels on a besoin de travailler collectivement. Je pense qu'on en est tous conscients. Je ne pense pas que ce soit un refus de, de les aborder, mais euh, finalement, on est, on est tellement nombreux, il y a tellement de choses à partager qu'on n'a pas vraiment de temps pour euh, traiter ces angles morts. J'espère qu'on aura d'autres euh, étapes pour les travailler un peu plus en profondeur. C'est difficile de prédire comment le mouvement va évoluer, parce que tellement de choses vont être faites par des personnes dans leurs très locales, micro-circumstances, qui vont se build up higher. Which not incidentally, is the source of the strength of it because the commons grows organically from rooted social and ecological circumstances. If all those people reinventing the commons, reconstructing the commons, creating new commons out there, name themselves a commoner, then we can talk about the commons movement, at it. but it may take us five more years. Dans dix ans, euh, le commun sera euh, le, 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 presque un langage quotidien et que peut-être dans 20 ou 30 ans, euh, bon ça c'est peut-être un peu optimiste, mais ça pourrait même être euh, la base d'un nouveau système euh, social et économique. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Armin Medos. I will guide you and us and myself through this afternoon, and I hope we will have a nice and pleasant cruise through this first uh, half-day public part of the Economics and the Commons Conference. Um, Uh, the film that we have just seen is from an umbrella organization called uh, Remix the Commons and from a partner in, uh, organization of Remix the Commons from Africa. And it is very interesting. There's a special purpose for showing it now because of, uh, quite a few of the interviews that you have seen here have been made at the end of the first conference that was held here three years ago. And then some were made at the World Social Forum and... Um, 
then the images from the rally at the end were from a rally in Quebec, which was one of the last year, which was one of the biggest manifestations of that kind ever held in Canada. So, what we can, the question that we can ask here through this video is, how far have we come since that first conference happened? Is there a difference in the feeling about the commons? It's also in the questions. Is it uh, from, from seed form to core paradigm? I think that's a very good subtitle. I can say that because I haven't made it. And, um, and that's a very important question, really, why we are here. Is there such a possibility that the commons does become a core paradigm? Um, I will keep the whole welcoming thing short because in a few minutes Barbara Unmusik, president of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, will give the welcome address. Just a few things, a few technicalities. Uh, there is Wi-Fi in the room, so if you all just go downloading video at the same time, it will break down because it's also it's a, uh, the network commons. It's uh, from Freifunk. Net. So that's the network here. Freifunk is a fantastic commoners uh, initiative in, in, in Berlin making free wireless community networks. Uh, there's also a special hashtag. So if you want to tweet the latest ideas out of this discussion onto the World Wide Web, it's um, four, it's, it's, the, it's hash four as the number four and then just the commons, for the commons. Yeah? And there is also a web page where new things are being updated, and that's commonsandeconomics.org. In one word, I'm not going to spell it, it's too long for spelling, commonsandeconomics.org. Yeah, so uh, we have already begun, and I'm starting to feel a bit nervous now. Uh, what shall I say? I shall not say much in this first part, um, but if I'm pressed to say one thing, uh, it's really that what I find very exciting in the more recent developments about the commons, because I've also been involved in those things for quite a while now, is that the commons has become a verb, commoning. And that is so exciting, especially in May. It is springtime, although it's a bit chilly outside today, but generally uh, that's the time for putting out the seeds, for, for watering the plants. The commons is not a thing, it's an activity. It's about building things together. It's about creating, it's about growing, it's about nurturing, and then those seeds maybe will start to sprout. It's also something which is not just about a do-it-yourself culture, it's much more about doing it with others. So the commons is also about enabling, facilitating. And all that also implies an expenditure of energy. We exhaust ourselves by doing it, but it's a beautiful form of exhaustion. It's an extension of ourselves, and all that um, is necessary for exploring new realities, and that's what we are here for today and in the coming days when we will have the closed sessions. I'm now going to present our first speaker, who has been doing a lot of enabling and facilitating, Barbara Unmusik, uh, if you maybe can come up. <laughs> Applause for Barbara Unmusik, she's the president. <laughs> she is the president of Heinrich Böll Foundation. She has studied political science at Freie Universität Berlin and has been active in north-south political issues as a researcher and publisher since the 1980s. Uh, she has done so, old, so I mean. many things, so many things. <laughs> but uh, one thing in particular, she has been already coordinating German NGOs at the famous Rio conference in '92, and she has been involved uh, for a long time in building up the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. First as a chairman of the supervisory board, chairwoman, please. chairwoman, please, sorry, and now as one of its <laughs> two presidents. Now, if I may ask you an initial question. Um, how does it feel for you to have this conference here today? Yeah, of course, great. I'm very proud having you here again. I think it's, I will refer to that, it's a common effort. But you can imagine for me it's really wonderful to meet people again and to, yeah, just to be host of such a big event for the upcoming two and a half days. Thanks very much. Barbara will speak about building bridges and about not allowing the commons to be fragmented. And please, here you go. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you so much and good afternoon and um, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, and of course, welcome for you, the commoners. Um, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Common Strategies Group, the Charles Leopold Mayer Foundation and Remix the Commons. Welcome and I would like to open this conference on behalf of the four organizations who made this going to happen. Thank you at the beginning for the four organizations. For me, I think it's a great, great pleasure to be host and co-organizer for this second international conference on the Commons. Many of you may have participated in the first one uh, in this very same spot in November 2010. I think a lot of documentation is around about the November meeting and many people will recall uh, this event almost three years ago. It makes us confident to bring together some of the most active, thoughtful commoners from around the world. I'm very much looking forward for two and a half days of debates and mutual, real mutual exchange. There are great expectations for learning, for the learning that will take place and new friends and colleagues that each of us will get to know. Once again, this conference, like the last one in November 2010, is an experiment. We at the Heinrich Böll Foundation see ourselves as providing an important space for networking, learning, and the incubation of new ideas and projects. And I think such an institution like Heinrich Böll Foundation has really to spend, I even would say, money and time for creating those spaces because we need spaces to think and to rethink more than ever in, a decay, in decades where we are suffering from a lot of crisis. Once again, um, let me explain how we have designed this conference and I also would like to explain what it, this conference is not designed for. First, as you easily can see, this is above all an international conference. We have more than 200 participants from more than 30 different countries of the world. Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Canada, Costa Rica, Croatia, France, India, Indonesia, Italy, even Mali, welcome, Mexico, the Philippines, Poland, Senegal, Spain, Tunisia, the United Kingdom, and the United Sp Sp uh, States, to name just a few. We have commoners who deal with forests and fisheries and with water and farmlands. We have commoners who deal with software and the internet and with social media and open source hardware design. We have commoners who are trying to reclaim urban life and spaces and commoners who are trying to preserve and extend scientific, scientific knowledge and creative works. We have commoners who are defending subsistence commons and commons maintained by indigenous peoples. What a richness, I would say. Whatever the commons, we want to organize them in ways they, that take gender perspectives into account and overcome structural injustices that still disadvantage mainly women. I think this diversity is our strength here, not only in the room, but everywhere where you are working for creating and maintain the commons. Our overriding goal is to explore the commons as a shared paradigm that embraces all of these commons. As I and we understand it, the distinction between natural commons and knowledge commons is, I would like to say, somewhat artificial. 
because, and this is, we really want to bring forward, all comments are based on knowledge in one way or another. Whether it's free software or open, or open access publishing or forest or shared farmland, a community's collective knowledge is an inten indispensable part of commoning. In short, all commons are knowledge commons and all commons are social commons. A great deal of the conference will, de will be devoted to exploring how to bridge the lines that appear to separate us the divisions between the so-called natural resources and the digital commons, and the divisions between those of the northern and the industrialized, uh, northern industrialist countries and those of the global south, and the divisions between commoners who use a scientific or academic discourse and those who are more political and activist-oriented. The way to overcome these divisions is to recognize that the commons movement is about much more than any particular resource, location or historical experience, important as they are. This is why we want to take special care to avoid sectorization of the commons and the further fragmentation of the commons discussions and the fragmentations of activists. I think we all know if we are joined, we are stronger. Over the last few years, it has become clear that there is truly a great convergence among commoners, but it's not an easy, automatic or uniform process. This is why a key intention of this conference is to further clarify our understanding of the commons and to make concrete plans for moving forward, both theoretically and practically. Inevitably, our visions and plans will reflect a great diversity of ideas and approaches, but unified by certain fundamental principles and shared commitments. Let me even add, let's not be afraid of Ethiopia. Only if we imagine the world of tomorrow, we can start building it in the world today. We see this conference definitely as an open space that will allow us to explore the commons freely and honestly, with critical intelligence, but also with tolerance and respect for our differences. Perhaps the most important technique of commoning is the capacity to listen, really listen to each other, even if we do not agree. I see this as the only way that we can come together to forge a shared political vision and to coordinate plans for moving forward in the future. But even as we try to forge a sense of common purpose amidst difference, we want our conversations here to have some focus and some structure. This is why we devised five different streams with their own coordinators, themes, and breakout sessions. These streams deal with the commons as they deal with land and water, working and caring, knowledge and culture, infrastructure and money and value. We will also have a concluding keynote on a topic that cuts across all these streams, life, spirituality, and the search for meaning. We are very, very grateful
to the stream coordinators for their handwork in pulling together their respective stream. I really would like to thank Saki Bailey, Mike Linksweyer, Miguel Vieira, Stephen Meritz, Ludwig Schuster and Heike Löschmann, as well as Andreas Weber. Thank you for, so much for all the work you did for getting these streams together. I think a clap. <laughs> the Common Strategies Group, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, the Charles Leopold Mayer Foundation, and Remix the Commons, the four organizers of this conference, see these streams as critical for the future of the Commons. We need to clarify the challenges that we face in each of these areas. We very much hope that the conference will provi provide some space for helping us identify the key political challenges that need to be addressed, to catalyze imagination and formula formulate the most strategic and effective ways to advance the Commons paradigm in your country and around the globe. All ideas are most welcome, well beyond, beyond these two and a half days. We want to continue to make fruitful exercises here to bring it home to your local or country-based activities. While the Heinrich Boll Foundation is, thrill is thrilled to be hosting the, this economics and commons conference, please know it's your conference. Let us make best use of out of it. Let me end with a big, big thank uh, to all of those who ha helped us to make this happen, who worked very hard for many months ahead for this opening to conceptualize, to set the stage, to get you here, and to pro provide we, you with food and shelter. Thank you for our, comp uh, for, uh, um, pardon me, thank you and our cooperation partners for this such big effort. But allow me to single out just a few individuals. First, the members of our strategic partner, the Commons Strategies Group. My personal thank, thank, go, thank you goes once again to Silke Helfrich, David Bollier, and Michael Bowens. Thank you so much. And definitely, I would like to extend my very cordial thank to Heike Löschmann. She is the heart and the key person here in the Heinrich Böll Foundation. She is the bridge builder of those what is going, uh, what is happening around the Commons worldwide to us in the Heinrich Böll Foundation and of course as well to me personally. Thank you Heike for, and your team to bring us here. My thank you goes also to Frederick and Nicholas and your teams in Paris and Lausanne. And I think it's worthwhile to mention that uh, the cooperation, the partners who are co-organizing this conference are coming from France and Switzerland. And I think that's good news as well. <laughs> Just my last, last word once again. It's your conference. Make best use out, out of it. And I herewith declare this conference open now. Thank you very much for your attention and welcome once again. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara Unmusik, for this very generous speech, I would say. Um, we are now going to have two keynote speeches by... Uh, first, uh, Stefano Rodota, and then by Maristella Svampa. And after that, uh, after those two speeches, we will then immediately open up for discussion and we'll hopefully have 30 minutes where you can ask questions. 
because I think, I feel there's something special in this room. So many people come from so many different places from far away. And there's this sort of groundswell of the commons can really be felt, I think, in the feelings ex expressed already now in reactions to Barbara's speech. Um, Stefano Rodota is going to take things a bit further in the, the realities of the law, the state and politics. The title of his talk is Constituting the Commons in the Context of State, Law and Politics. Uh, Stefano is a professor of law at La Sapienza University of Rome, co-author of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, former member of the Italian Parliament, the European Parliament, and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. He is also chair of the Scientific Committee of the Agency for Fundamental Rights of the European Union and of the Internet Governance Forum in Italy, also former president of the Italian Data Protection Commission and of the European Group on Data Protection. And very recently, he almost was voted Italian president. <laughs> <laughs> Stefano, thank you a lot for uh, joining us here. Um, just to give a short introduction, um, but, uh, Stefano, who has been dealing with fundamental rights for a long time, um, he makes a very strong connection between fundamental rights and the commons and common goods. So uh, also he will be giving some examples where recently citizens have really exerted their rights and which underline the possibility of mass intervention and that also this sort of exercise of citizenship really points to the possible development of a sort of planetary commons. But um, we have this big thesis here and uh, let me ask you, I mean, if the thesis here is that the commons becomes the new core paradigm, do you think it's possible? I think it's possible. It's, we need a lot of work, a lot of discussion, openness, confrontation, and information. I think that it's a long way, but we have already had some very exciting results. It's for that that I am here. Thank you, Stefano, and please would you now give your talk. Oh, thank you for this kind invitation. I am very happy to be here. To be here, and I would like, I will, will try to raise some problems and to signal some uh, connection related to the very important, difficult debate about common. I would like to start making reference to what happened exactly two years ago in Italy, where 27 million Italian citizens voted against the privatization of the water, cancelling via referendum some legal rules on water as commodity. In this very moment, in seven countries in Europe, uh, have been collected more than one million and a an half signature. Uh, for a citizen's initiative, according to Article 12 of the Lisbon Treaty, asking the European Commission to take an initiative aimed at water services not to be privatized. Why, I am, uh, why am I making reference to these two cases? For two reasons. First of all, because they make apparent how it's possible to have mass mobilization through the existing institutional channels in the perspective of new rules recognizing some goods as commons. Secondly, and mainly, because they show that a new exercise in citizenship is emerging directly connected with the fundamental rights and common goods. In this perspective, citizenship cannot be conceived as a tool separating people, but as a bundle of rights people carry along through the world, making possible individual and collective access to some categories of goods 
without any market mediation. From this point of view, we could say that more and more the whole world is becoming a planetary commons, a common place of a global citizenship where people could circulate free of consents regarding a national belonging in order to make effective their fundamental rights and to be respected in their essential humanity. Thus, it makes apparent the direct relationship between persons' fundamental rights and common goods, and that personal rights and common goods become mutually interrelated. Generalizing this assumption, we could conclude that the common goods are the result of a social construction. More precisely, they are produced by the fundamental rights. Some years ago, an Italian scholar published a book whose title is Homo Civicus, The Reasonable Madness of Common Goods. Why is citizenship seen as directly related to common goods? And why are these goods referred to via an oxymoron, placing madness alongside reason? In fact, we must be aware that a new rationality is needed and this merging, and that we must deal with this change, with new forms of social, economic, cultural, political rationalities. In fact, the true madness could result from a cultural and political blindness unable to elaborate the categories giving social evidence, cultural foundation, and institutional support to the perspective of the commons. However, two problems arise immediately from the prospectively boundless citizenship. The former one has to do with the very quality of citizenship. It's not longer a formal requirement, a set of rights and duties allocated in a static perspective. Rather, it's a set of powers and opportunities, and the individual should be in position to turn into reality, who's using them to determine the mechanisms of participation in politics and, generally speaking, public life, which is exactly the life of the city. This is why the words homo civicus, civicus citizen, have been used. They highlight this active stance whereby if every citizen is turning into the leading character. And this, why is, and this is why reference has been made to a strong citizenship to underline the need for making available the tools required to bring life into these stands. It means that referred to a planetary commons, citizenship is no more a tool separating people and defines the very condition of individuals in the world where they encounter and produce planetary goods. Thus, we must deal with two categories, citizenship and globalization and we must revisit and redefine them in the perspective of the opposite of the property, the commons, so challenging two of the foundation of the modernity, property and sovereignty. If this is a correct approach, the next step implies a direct and clear answer to a crucial question. Are we living a revival of the historical concept and the experience of the commons, or we are dealing with a true discontinuity. New worlds are crossing the world, creating a sense of a change of age. Open source, free software, no copyright, open data, free access to water, food, drugs, knowledge, internet as a fundamental right of every person. And it happens in a space characterized by two essential novelties, immaterial and cross-border dimension. Reflecting on this, on this new reality, we can understand the reference to what happened in, uh, mainly in England to the enclosure movement. 
Batica could result much more in an intellectual opera operation for giving the strongest legitimization to the common goods approach than in a useful tool for analyzing the dynamics of the present and for design scenarios of the future. I would raise a question. Trying to enter into the postmodernity, are we risking a regression to the pre-modernity? Speaking frankly, inside the rich multifarious discussion of commons, there is an emerging risk trend towards what can be looked at, at as a kind of nostalgic approach of a metaphysical foundation of the commons. Does it suggest that not only to have a gas beyond the market and the state, but to conceive the commons on one side or as a model then that can be built up according to the past experiences and on the other side as the only way out the, cri the crisis we are living a revolutionary change radically uh, a revolution changing radically our society some remarks on this attitude could be useful for discussion not only in the field of the commons can we discover what has been since a long time called an institutional new medievalism. If, for instance, we have a look, at, a look to at Manuel Castell's researches on the information society or at the theoretical description of a world marked by a multiplicity of a civil constitution, we easily discover that they start from the idea of a world without a center, to be organized around many communities producing their own rules and practices. But the features of this new Middle Age can rather produce dispersion, fragmentation, production of many centers with conflicting interests, difficulties precisely in direction of the identification of what is the specificity of commons. Many historians have stressed the risk of transplant in our environment of concept and model related to commons coming out from non-democratic societies. Taking seriously the idea of discontinuity, we must deal with another crucial problem. How can we identify the common goods? The answer cannot be found searching an inner nature of commons. In fact, discontinuity implies that we have to look at historical process so that commons, from this point of view, must be considered a social construction, the result of popular social struggles, the result of serious reflection, theoretical reflection. They are first and foremost a matter of the organization of the society at large, of the position of individuals and groups inside the social environment. According to, his analysis, to this analysis, the way the commons are recognized affects the distribution of the power and shows their transformative attitude. At large, this approach implies that we must go beyond a naturalistic view of commons. It's true that the new constitutionalism, emerging mainly in Latin America, makes explicit reference to the extension of rights to nature. That, for instance, Michel Serre called for a natural contract between humans and non-human beings, that there is a materialistic approach nowadays asking for a parliament of things, maybe with, a, with an involuntary reminiscence of the Internet 3.0, the Internet of Things. And we can remember a seminal essay published in 1972 by Christopher Stone whose title was 
should we have standing toward legal rights for natural objects? But looking deeper in this document, we can easily discover that they indicate, more or less in details, the ways and the legal means natural objects can be taken into account and which are the subject charged of their respect and protection. Thus, is the artificial world of the institutional procedures and of the legal rules that takes the responsibility to make effective the guarantees and gives the nature the adequate protection. Democracy needs this approach. Otherwise, who can speak on behalf of the natural? We must escape the risk of authoritarian initiative, precisely because in the last years we had an impressive collective effort on the way of the full acknowledgement of the importance of the relationship with the environment, of the cultural traditions, of the popular consciousness. Thus we must concentrate our efforts on the machinery for making the common perspective effective. A very re recent judgment of the India Supreme Court in the Novartis affairs, pro affair provides some important suggestions. As you know, the Supreme Court denied Novartis' request for patent protection for its Gleevec cancer treatment, allowing the national nation's generic drug makers to continue to sell copies of the drug at a lower price. The difference is between 2700 and $170. The public health activists praised the judgment saying that it would protect India's ability to make inexpensive genetics so that India was confirmed as the pharmacy of the de developing world. We could say that through this kind of judicial intervention, the reasonable madness of the common goods penetrated the patent's fortress, one of the strongest features of the property in the dimension of the material. Very shortly, we can reassume the case making reference to the conflict between the fundamental right to health and the property rights of Big Pharma, well known since the time when the South Africa Supreme Court intervened in a similar issue. The solution has been grounded on, the, on Indian patent law promoted by a popular movement aimed to give right to health effective protection. The connection between these fundamental rights and an equitable access to drugs opens the way towards a consideration in this field of knowledge as perspective common. Nothing natural but the production of common good through the full recognition of health as fundamental rights. This model can be generalized, finding a strong support in the new constitutionalism of the needs or of the material life, made evident in particular by Constitution and Supreme Court's intervention in the area connecting Latin America, South Africa, India. New categories are emerging as access, commons, not community-based, common service and utilities. It's not world that the founder of the web Tim Berners-Lee, answering a question on the opportunity to recognize the access to Internet as a fundamental right, made the comparison with access to water. Those water in material world and knowledge on the web are both looked at in the commons perspective, beyond the market, but at the same time being aware of the necessity to have a state giving openly and tangibly support to the initiative that contributes to build up commons. This approach can and must be generalized, escaping the risk of a self-reference attitude or of an ex 
exclusive bottom-up analysis and exploring the role of supportive institutions, policy regimes, and law. An integrated approach is needed combining social practices and institutional machinery. In fact, looking at knowledge, we must take into account the increasing role played by copyrights rule in recent times, mainly because it's the fault mechanism. The pervasive effects of this trend have been summarized, for instance, by Lawrence Lessig, making reference to a growing series of cases where it was asked for money for films or pictures showing the facade of a building in the street, a very well-known monument, a piece of the signed furniture. As conclusion, Lessig reported the advice of a successful di direct, film director to a young artist. You are totally free to make a movie in an empty room with your two friends. Reacting to this attitude, as you know, and inspired by the success of the free software movement between 2000 and 2002, a group of scholars, entrepreneurs, and activists proposed to produce a new set of rules called the Creative Commons, followed in January 2010 by a public domain manifesto and by the reinforcement of relations between the criticism of the patent rules and the no copyright movement. These different cases confirm that the right attitude toward the commons is the kaleidoscope, not a forced unitary perspective. Look, for instance, at the management of the commons. The reference to a community raises at least two questions. How can we avoid the conflict of interest among different communities? How can we manage the not community-based commons? Dealing with the conflict of interest, the new medievalism reveals its inadequacy because its attitude towards separation and a relational approach is needed. As for, as for the not community-based commons, we can look, for instance, at the knowledge on the web where it's not possible to identify a managing community in a population of more than two billion people. The way to be followed is not the attempt to create an impossible subject, but the definition of the rules making the access universal and not mediated by the market is the same legal status of the good to be taken into account and built up as a common. Thus, we can make a step forward, the right approach to the common perspective and its general framework. Commons are reshaping the relationship with the world of, between the world of persons and the world of, the, of goods. Consequently, we cannot separate the analysis of the common from the general reflection on what are becoming a private and public property in an environment that is changed precisely by the growing commons of awareness. The new, the new enlarged vision of the common goods defines a third dimension alongside the two traditional ones and reacts on their relationship. Starting from this point of view and en enlarging the horizon, it could be useful to have a look at what is happening in the digital world of Google and Facebook. The role played by these two global players, Facebook with its more a billion participants, is the third nation in the world after China and India, is suggesting reflection, starting from the fact that they are performing a role similar to some public services, implying their consideration as utilities, giving evidence to public and common interests. It's more apparent on the side of management. After the controversial history of a referendum open and then cancelled on, on Facebook in an authoritarian way by, by its founder, there are now proposals to give voice 
to the face of people according to some models of the representative democracy. It means that the community is recognized, which must be organized and play a role. Maybe this are problem beyond the strict consideration of the commons, giving room a risky inflation of the reference to what must be correctly defined as a common good. But they are part of more general movement redesigning the boundaries between the different categories of goods and services in a new perspective. It means that we are facing a new distribution of powers and in its per perspective, common goods are strongly grounded in the constitution, giving evidence to what can be called the constitutionalization of the person, so that a comprehensive definition of the common goods could make reference to the goods functionally necessary for making effective the person's fundamental rights and the fulfillment of her his personality. These goods reflect collective interest, are finalized to the fulfillment of collective needs, make possible the effectiveness of fundamental rights. As you know, common goods belong to all at nobody. All people can have access, but nobody must have exclusive rights. They are shared per se. They must be managed starting from the equality and solidarity principles, improving different forms of interested people participation. They reflect the dimension of the future so that they must be managed in the future generation's interest to making effective the intergenerational solidarity. In this sense, they are a, a truly heritage of the humanity and all interested persons must be legitimized to intervene in order to make effective and to protect them. In the very nature of these goods, there is this sharing of responsibilities amongst different actors, the effectiveness of equality, the building up of social relationship instead of selfish separation. In this wider perspective, we can discover some forgotten, lost words. The common interest, whose reference disappeared, submerged by the force of personal private interest. The social relationship, because the very nature of these goods produces continuous interrelation, testified not only by the web. The future, considered by the short-termism, whilst the common goods embody the long span approach and oblige it to take into account the future generation. Equality as a direct effect of the way these goods are accepted and exploited. Thus, all these words drive towards a fresh regards on what democracy means nowadays. Other models and other rules have been adopted in other times and in other parts of the world. Well, but what is happening nowadays is something new for all. The awareness of the essential role can be played by the common goods perspectives is emigrating from the periphery to the core of the legal system, from a narrow local to a global dimension. But the democracy of the commons cannot be conceived as a catch-all process. I am very suspicious toward the mystic of the common as the sole category for a progressive social and political action towards a metaphysic vision of the commons irrespective of the history and of the social dynamics. We must escape the temptation of an extension of the qualification of commons to every good or service. We are risking the inflation we risk losing the specificity of the common. If all is a common, nothing is a common. In an enlarged vision of the global constitutionalism, commons are a transformative force, not the constitution itself. A large, diffuse, and increasing movement is at work everywhere in the world. The first important result of this collective action is the successful challenge to the obliged separation of persons and goods between public and private sphere. The separation has, has not disappeared, but we can look at the world 
free from the obsession of the possessive individualism, from the category of appropriation as a unique tool for defining the same anthropology around the homo economicus. In fact, we are working in a meta-state and meta-individual dimension where we can encounter not an ambiguous post-democracy, but the participatory process of liberation of constraints, giving people the opportunity to exercise a strong citizenship, to fully implement the rights interrelated with, with different common goods, so reinforcing the democracy in itself through the respect of the dignity and the same life of every person. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. That was a very interesting speech. Um, um, we are now uh, moving on to the next speaker, Maristella Swampa. Uh, she will speak on commons beyond development, the strategic value of the commons as a paradigm shift. Maristella Swampa is a researcher at the CONICET, the National Center for Scientific and Technical Research in Argentina, and also professor at the Universidad Nacional de la Plata, the province of Buenos Aires, and she is a coordinator of the group of critical studies of the development and a member of the collective Voces de Alerta. Um, she has published many books, has been lecturing widely, and um, also her topics always have a sort of an activist edge. Um, do you feel yourself also to be an activist of a kind or just, or just researcher? I uh, I'm an amphibious intellectual. I very much like this term. We yes, had this it's conversation. A new category for yeah. me. The amphibious intellectual. Yes. Yes, who can swim in both waters and be in territory. I think there's an interesting link between this talk and the next one because uh, in Latin America always had a very specific sort of dialectics. On one hand, Latin America has been hit very hard by neoliberal austerity programs by shock treatments prescribed from the uh, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and other forces. So uh, Latin American countries have experienced this kind of austerity programs we have now in Europe since the 1970s and 1980s. And uh, they were tr truly destructive on and on again. But at the same time, Latin America has developed a lot of very creative and imaginative ways of resistance and also of building of new coalitions, of new forces, of finding a new language. And I think this is something that uh, Maristella will now uh, give us some further insights into. Thank you, Maristella Svampa. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Good afternoon, uh, buenas tardes, oh, sorry, uh, bonjour. <laughs> if you, uh, Maristela will be speaking uh, in yes, Spanish uh, and we need uh, our I, headphones now. I go to talk in Spanish, so uh, excuse me. Voy a hablar en español. Este, de esa manera, este, al menos tengo la ilusión de que voy a ser comprendida. Este, o voy a tratar de ser más clara. Eh, muchas gracias por la invitación. Eh, celebro la oportunidad eh, que nos brinda aquí la Fundación Hagel Bell de discutir cuestiones que están efectivamente en el debate hoy en día en diferentes países, en una situación que es sin duda cada vez más difícil e inclusive en América Latina, que es un laboratorio de producción de nuevas ideas, nuevos imaginarios, es cada vez más perturbador y más difícil defender aquello que llamamos commons. Yo voy a hacer una presentación en tres partes. En una primera parte voy a hablar de la situación, voy a tratar de enmarcar cuál es este, el escenario de debates en América Latina para dejar de lado también ciertas idealizaciones que se hacen sobre el continente. En segundo lugar, voy a tratar de presentar de manera muy esquemática 
cuáles son los lenguajes este, de las resistencias colectivas. Y en tercer lugar voy a hablar de manera más específica sobre los bienes comunes y cómo, desde mi perspectiva, es pensado en América Latina. Por supuesto, antes que nada, una aclaración. Eh, en América Latina está generalizado el término de bienes comunes eh, para hacer eh, alusión, sobre todo, a las luchas eh, en la defensa del territorio, la biodiversidad, el ambiente. Eh, es difícil traducir commons en ese sentido y mucho menos utilizar el término que proviene del español antiguo, que es procomún. Hablamos de bienes comunes. Pero quiero aclarar también que esto incluye eh, los espacios y formas de cooperación social, de uso y goce común, de producción y reproducción del conocimiento. Esto es, eh, lo común o los bienes comunes hacen alusión a los códigos compartidos de organización de la vida colectiva. Aquello que el mexicano Gustavo Esteba hace varios años ya denominaba como ámbitos de la comunidad para designar un conjunto de relaciones sociales. Primera parte, ¿en dónde estamos eh, en América Latina? Eh, yo creo que en, las, en el último decenio en América Latina hemos pasado del consenso de Washington al consenso de los commodities. Este, esto para señalar que efectivamente en la etapa actual eh, América Latina ha aceptado pasivamente el lugar que se le da en el proceso de división internacional del trabajo como proveedor de materias primas a granel, esto es, a gran escala y sin mayor procesamiento. Esto es algo que afecta a los países del sur, a los países periféricos, no solo a América Latina, sino también África y Asia. Eh, por commodity entendemos aquellos eh, bienes este, o productos indiferencia, indiferenciados cuyos precios se definen internacionalmente y que efectivamente son sobre todo materias primas. En América Latina sobre todo provee de productos alimentarios como el maíz, la soya, el trigo, hidrocarburos y metales y minerales. No es que esto sea novedoso en América Latina, pero en los últimos 10 o 15 años ha habido una intensificación este, y expansión de megaproyectos destinados al control, extracción y exportación de bienes naturales sin mayor agregado. Lo que aquí denominamos como consenso de los commodities pretende designar no solamente un orden económico, sino también, voy más despacio, un orden político ideológico. Es un orden económico que está sostenido por el boom de las materias primas este, y la demanda cada vez mayor, por ejemplo, sobre todo de parte de potencias emergentes como China, que interviene muy claramente ahora en los países eh, del sur. Pero esto sin duda genera ventajas comparativas en este, el territorio latinoamericano a través del crecimiento de las exportaciones que redunda en crecimiento económico. Sin embargo, como sabemos, este proceso genera nuevas divisiones y asimetrías sociales, ambientales, pero también políticas y culturales. Genera nuevos procesos de dependencias y enclaves neocoloniales en América Latina. Lo que llamamos consenso de los commodities es un proceso vertiginoso y es complejo también, eh, porque efectivamente alude a un proceso de reprimarización de las economías en todo el área de los países del sur y porque conlleva un profundo proceso de desposesión, ¿no? la dinámica de desposesión ligada al modelo de acumulación actual ha sido analizada sobre todo por el geógrafo marxista David Harvey, para señalar precisamente este, el, la, la acumulación que hoy se basa, la dinámica de acumulación que hoy se basa en el despojo de tierras y de territorios a gran escala. En ese sentido, eh, una categoría central que se ha acuñado en América Latina y que recorre toda la literatura crítica es la de neoextractivismo. Por neoextractivismo lo que se entiende son aquellos procesos de sobreexplotación de los bienes naturales que este, son agotables, son finitos, ¿no? y la este, expansión de las fronteras de explotación del capital hacia los territorios considerados antes como improductivos. 
Lo que denominamos neoextractivismo no abarca solamente, entonces, por ejemplo, la extracción de minerales, sino también la expansión de la frontera de la explotación de la soya, de la frontera pesquera, de la frontera hídrica, en fin, una serie de actividades ligadas a la gran escala de los emprendimientos y, sobre todo, cuyo destino es la exportación. No son los países de origen, sino los países más poderosos que se ven beneficiados por esto. El neoextractivismo tiene una dinámica vertical, es decir, se impone sobre los territorios, desplazando economías regionales, reorientando a esos territorios, acaparando tierras, expulsando comunidades rurales, campesinas e indígenas y violentando procesos de decisión ciudadana. Entonces, no es solo una actividad, sino un conjunto de actividades que marca cada vez más una tendencia a la especialización productiva en materias primas por parte de los países latinoamericanos. Por último, cuando hablamos de consenso, sé que no es muy simpático utilizarlo, estamos reenviando la idea de consenso de Washington cuando en los años 90 en América Latina, como aquí, quizás también ahora, se decía que no había otra alternativa al neoliberalismo. Lo que sucede hoy en día es que efectivamente el consenso de los commodities también promueve esta idea de que no hay otra alternativa, que hay que aceptar la dinámica del extractivismo, aceptar el lugar que la división internacional del trabajo nos da, les da a los países poseedores de riquezas naturales, este, y en ese caso suturar, cerrar, clausurar la posibilidad de pensar alternativas. Esto es muy claro y me parece muy importante subrayarlo. El consenso de los commodities transmite, más allá que estemos hablando de un país con gobierno conservador o de un país con gobierno progresista o de izquierda, lo que transmite es una ideología de la resignación, lo que transmite es la idea que debemos aceptar el capitalismo, en ese sentido, sea estatal o de mercado, como lo único razonable. Y en ese sentido, dejar de lado aquellas resistencias que cuestionan el avance de esta dinámica extractivista por fundamentalista, antimoderna, o etcétera, etcétera. Sin embargo, tercer elemento... Este panorama va ligado, obviamente, a una explosión de conflictos socioambientales. En toda América Latina tenemos hoy en día una explosión de conflictos ambientales ligados a la megaminería, ligados a la desposesión de territorios, ligado a la construcción de represas hidroeléctricas, ligados a la explotación de petróleo, de gas, por ejemplo, de gas no convencional, el, este, el, el shale gas o este, el gas por fracturación hidráulica que pretende imponerse. En fin, son una serie de eh, actividades que hoy se expanden en América Latina, de la cual sin duda la mega minería es como la figura más extrema. ¿no? Por eso les pongo la pantalla, este, ahí eh, doy cuenta de la cantidad digamos, de conflictos, sacando los datos del Observatorio de Conflictos Mineros de América Latina, para que ustedes vean la progresión de conflictos sobre o conflictos ligados a la mega minería que hay en América Latina, que son efectivamente muchos, van en aumento y casi todos los países latinoamericanos tienen hoy en día conflictos ligados a la misma. Hay conflictos emblemáticos que en ese sentido han servido también para clarificar cuál es este, el discurso concreto y real de los diferentes gobiernos respecto de estos temas. El conflicto de Conga el, es un proyecto de mega minería en Perú, que este, Perú en el último año y medio esto ha costado 25 muertos en el Perú, este, en el marco del gobierno de Ollanta Humala, el conflicto del Tibnes, territorio indígena, donde Evo Morales proponía realizar una carretera, también ha sido un parteaguas para el gobierno boliviano, el conflicto de la construcción de la represa de Belomonte, la represa, una de las represas más grandes del mundo, también ha dado que hablar y ha producido un conflicto y un día de discusión muy importante en Brasil. Simplemente para terminar esta primera parte, estas son las consignas este, que eh, rodean la lucha contra la mega minería, el agua vale más que el oro, que efectivamente pone el acento en la noción de, este, de la defensa del bien común, el agua, 
como también esta es una foto de las más bellas que hay, de este, la población peruana movilizada este, contra el proyecto de Conga, que defienden sobre todo a cuatro lagunas que serían secadas si efectivamente se llevara a cabo el este, emprendimiento o el proyecto minero Conga. Es decir, son muchas las luchas, son, digamos, hay un avance muy fuerte de la criminalización de la protesta, una nueva oleada de violación de derechos humanos, más allá de lo que efectivamente se ha dado en América Latina en, el, en los últimos diez años, que esto no me parece este, menor re, recalcarlo. Eh, hay continuidades y hay rupturas con respecto a los años 90, con respecto al neoliberalismo. Pero sobre todo, este, el consenso de los commodities incluye, digamos, tanto a los gobiernos conservadores como a los gobiernos progresistas o de centro izquierda, aun si hay diferencias notorias de unos y otros. Los gobiernos progresistas ponen el acento, sobre todo, en la intervención del Estado y en las formas de participación de lo popular. Sin embargo, sin embargo, y esto es fundamental, en su primera fase los gobiernos progresistas eh, significaron una expansión de las fronteras del derecho. ¿no? Esto se vio muy claro en Ecuador y en Bolivia, donde se constitucionalizaron los derechos colectivos de las poblaciones indígenas y donde además se sancionaron, por ejemplo, en el caso de Ecuador, los derechos de la naturaleza. ¿no? Hubo un momento de articulación importante entre movimientos sociales y gobiernos que se expresó por la expansión de las fronteras de los derechos. Hoy en día asistimos a una retracción, a una reducción de las fronteras de esos derechos que fueron sancionados en los distintos países. Y vemos que efectivamente el resultado es el cercamiento de lo común a un enclave estatalista, ¿no? el Estado o los gobiernos que en todo caso hablan en nombre del Estado y que proponen este, la multiplicación de proyectos extractivistas que implican un ataque muy claro a los bienes comunes. Entonces, efectivamente, esa es eh, el, la situación, podríamos decir, en, en distintos países latinoamericanos. Eh, la gran conflictividad que hay este, explica también las resistencias que en América Latina este, tienen lugar hoy este, y que han significado la construcción de un nuevo lenguaje, ¿no? un nuevo lenguaje, marcos colectivos de la acción que los distintos movimientos socioambientales este, hoy en día desarrollan, los cuales hay varios tópicos. ¿No? El tópico de los bienes comunes, los commons, está muy presente, efectivamente, este, en tanto nuevo paradigma que se propone pensar lo común más allá del Estado, pero también, este, perdón, más allá del, del mercado, pero también más allá del Estado. Eh, tópicos como el de justicia ambiental también están desde el origen tratando de complejizar la cuestión para que no se vea simplemente como una cuestión técnica ligada a lo ambiental, sino que son procesos que aluden a desigualdades sociales, ambientales, de género, desigualdades raciales también. Entonces, el tópico de justicia ambiental aparece recorriendo las luchas, pero mucho más aparece el tópico del buen vivir, o el tema del buen vivir, o el vivir bien, que es un tópico que eh, alude o en todo caso remite a la cosmovisión de las poblaciones indígenas. Y sobre todo es en Bolivia y en Ecuador donde ha habido y hay todavía grandes discusiones sobre los contenidos reales de este concepto que, me permito decir, es un concepto en construcción, es un concepto muy genérico que reenvía sobre todo a la filosofía política, pero que propone pensar la relación Pueblo, sociedad, naturaleza, de modo distinto, en una relación de equilibrio y respeto del ecosistema. Sin embargo, este es un concepto que comienza a ser bastardeado, que comienza a ser vampirizado por los propios gobiernos este, progresistas. Son conceptos en disputa, en esa relación de tensión y contradicción que hay entre movimientos que defienden lo común y los propios gobiernos progresistas que hoy apoyan los proyectos este, o emprendimientos extractivistas. Y el último concepto, voy muy rápido porque me interesa eh, en todo caso no este, extenderme más eh, sobre el tema de bienes comunes, 
El último tópico es el de derechos de la naturaleza, también aquí el profesor Rodotá hizo referencia este, a eh, la constitu constitucionalización de nuevos derechos, en este caso este aparece sancionado por, única, por primera y única vez en la constitución de, de Ecuador y plantea claramente la necesidad de pensar a la naturaleza desde otro lugar que no sea el de la naturaleza como capital o instrumento. Esto es, plantea la necesidad de un pasaje de una visión antropocéntrica a una visión biosociocéntrica de la naturaleza. Hay también ahí muchas discusiones acerca de lo que significa este, eh, o cuál es el alcance de los derechos de la naturaleza y si esta puede ser pensada en términos de sujeto o no. Pero en todo caso, ese giro ecoterritorial, ese nuevo lenguaje, es producto de las luchas y las movilizaciones y de la articulación entre un saber experto, un saber experto independiente del Estado y del mercado, podríamos decir, ¿no? independiente de todo poder político y económico, en articulación con los saberes vernáculos, con los saberes siempre invisibilizados de las propias poblaciones hoy movilizadas en contra de estos grandes este, megaproyectos este, extractivistas. Eh, son, en ese sentido, marcos, marcos de la acción colectiva que sirven, o son conceptos horizonte también podríamos decir, que eh, constituyen el punto de partida para pensar alternativas este, al este, extractivismo. Y esta es la tercera parte a la cual quiero referirme. Voy muy rápido para la traducción, ¿no? ¿Está bien? Ok, me están pidiendo que vaya despacio. Ok. Este, alternativas. Estos, les decía, estos cuatro conceptos son conceptos horizontes. Este, a partir de los cuales se están pensando este, alternativas que tienen en común el cuestionamiento de la visión hegemónica de desarrollo. Esto es eh, fundamental eh, comprenderlo, este, que efectivamente el modelo eh, neoextractivo o extractivista está muy asociado a una idea convencional del desarrollo, a una visión productivista y economicista del mismo, que si bien fue muy cuestionada, por ejemplo, desde el paradigma ambiental y desde las propias visiones de las comunidades indígenas en los últimos 20 años, ha vuelto como gran relato a instalarse en nombre del progreso en América Latina. Y esto no hace distinción de gobiernos conservadores o de gobiernos progresistas. El desarrollo o el progreso se ha convertido nuevamente en un gran relato contenedor que expresa la alianza entre corporaciones transnacionales y este, gobiernos. Pero entonces, partimos del cuestionamiento de esa idea hegemónica de desarrollo, partimos del cuestionamiento de una visión instrumental también de la naturaleza, este, eh, de una visión de la naturaleza como capital este, o como canasta de recursos, eh, estas visiones desde las cuales se piensan las alternativas comparten entonces otras valoraciones de la naturaleza y del territorio, ¿no? que son visiones no productivistas, parten de una idea fuerte de sustentabilidad, porque también ha habido un vaciamiento y un bastardeo de la noción misma de sustentabilidad por parte de los propios gobiernos y las empresas a la hora de defender estos proyectos. Y, por supuesto, otro punto de partida es la idea de una racionalidad distinta, una racionalidad ambiental alternativa como horizonte del cual pensar o repensar las relaciones entre pueblos, sociedades y naturaleza. En esta línea se destaca, por ejemplo, eh, la propuesta del Centro Latinoamericano de Ecología Social, que este, ilustra eh, su director, Eduardo Gudinas, quien ha pensado toda, este, ha propuesto una serie de alternativas al extractivismo. Este, centradas en la idea de transición y post-extractivismo y que pretende dar una respuesta a gran escala, como es el extractivismo a gran escala en América Latina, este también propone una respuesta a gran escala desde las políticas públicas. Esto es, propone repensar un conjunto de políticas públicas que eh, reflexionen de modo diferente la articulación entre la cuestión de la redistribución 
la cuestión de la pobreza, que aparece muy presente, sobre todo en el discurso de los gobiernos progresistas, y por otro lado la cuestión ambiental. ¿no? Busca pensar o proponer políticas que combinen en ese sentido mayores controles ambientales, este, mayores impuestos con moratoria o suspensión de proyectos. Es una propuesta interesante, innovadora, que se está socializando en distintos países y este, discutiendo en el seno de grupos movilizados en el Perú, en Bolivia, en Ecuador, en Argentina, y que, por supuesto, es una propuesta que debe pensarse en términos regionales, ningún país podría salir solo, sino que hay que pensar en términos más bien este, regionales y en el orden de lo que los pueblos indígenas llaman buen vivir este, como horizonte. Esta es, podríamos decir, la propuesta que desde arriba y sobre todo asociada a la idea de políticas públicas, hoy se está proponiendo, pensando, discutiendo este, en América Latina. Pero hay otras también eh, propuestas, podríamos decir, otras miradas, otros abordajes que este, llevan... Eh, que ponen el acento en una reflexión desde abajo, desde la propia lógica de los movimientos sociales este, y que en ese sentido muestra también las tensiones y contradicciones desde las cuales se piensan las alternativas. Y en ese sentido sí me parece que la noción de bien común o de bienes comunes aparece como central. Todos los actores movilizados utilizan la noción este, de bien común como una noción o un concepto cargado de positividad este, y que aparece asociado a lo que yo considero son dos cuestiones fundamentales, la territorialidad y el eh, etos comunal. Este, voy a terminar entonces con eso. Eh, hay una asociación muy estrecha entre eh, bienes comunes y territorialidad. Eso, en los países del sur, en los países periféricos, la noción de territorialidad es esencial y es, como decía aquí eh, Rodotá también, no es algo dado, es algo construido. La territorialidad es una construcción social contrahegemónica que se opone precisamente a la visión que vehiculan las grandes empresas y los gobiernos, que es la de territorio productivo, la de territorio... Este, economicista, la de territorio socialmente vaciable en aras de la valorización del capital. Aquí se defiende una idea diferente de la territorialidad y por ende lo que se tiende a construir son relaciones sociales distintas en la cual el hombre forma parte del ecosistema y el territorio no es algo que se tiene, sino que se construye en términos simbólicos y sociales a través de la lucha misma. Esa noción de territorialidad pone el acento, entonces, en el hecho de que los bienes comunes no son un commodity, tampoco son un recurso natural estratégico, lo de commodity va a la, a la alusión al mercado, la instancia que se coloca respecto al mercado, lo de recurso natural estratégico, la instancia que se pone respecto del Estado, sino que son bienes comunes que permiten, en ese sentido, la producción y reproducción de la vida en los territorios. Y este es como el concepto fundamental. La territorialidad también se opone a la idea de acaparamiento y concentración propio del modelo extractivista. Y para mí, la segunda, el segundo concepto que sostiene esta idea de bienes comunes es la de etos comunal. Les cuento una, una anécdota. Cuando pensé en la noción de etos comunal, dije, no, a alguien se le debe haber ocurrido antes, seguro. Y investigué en Google. Y efectivamente, primero hay mucha literatura en América Latina sobre el sistema comunal, sobre las formas comunales. Pero la noción misma de etos comunal también ya ha sido muy trabajada. Y esto es interesante recuperarlo y ver qué es lo que nos dice la tradición de pensamiento latinoamericano sobre esto. Desde mi punto de vista, efectivamente, este, en la base de dicha construcción social y simbólica de la territorialidad, ¿no? vinculada a los bienes comunes, hay un etos específico. Hay un etos específico que es el etos comunal, que se concibe y se piensa desde otra lógica y racionalidad. ¿no? Yo retomo la, la teoría de los etos históricos de un ecuatoriano, que es Bolívar Echevarría, quien eh, ponía el acento precisamente en 
eh, la, este, un etos, decía él, es la cristalización de una estrategia de supervivencia inventada espontáneamente por la, por, este, la comunidad. El etos comunal, en ese sentido, cuestiona el núcleo del hecho capitalista porque apuesta a estructurar el mundo de la vida en referencia a un fin definido cualitativamente y porque actúa desde el valor de uso y no desde el valor de cambio, que es el principio estructurador del capitalismo ¿no? y que efectivamente se autonomiza como valor capital. Entonces, efectivamente da cuenta de las formas en que se organiza la vida, la socialidad, el comportamiento humano en la modernidad, el, el etos como tal, y el etos comunal en ese sentido aparece asociado efectivamente al paradigma de los bienes comunes y adopta o ha adoptado diferentes formas históricas. Dos de ellas nos parecen importantes. La primera de ellas es que efectivamente hay formas históricas ya que expresan este etos, este etos comunal, este, son formas comunales de la política y la vida social que nos han transmitido los pueblos eh, originarios y que eh, ponen el acento precisamente en el hecho de que este, las formas comunales son esos espacios o ámbitos ligados a la organización y reproducción que no se reconocen en el Estado, sino en lo colectivo. Y aquí me parece interesante subrayar lo siguiente. No estamos haciendo una apología nostálgica de la comunidad, porque en realidad cuando hablamos de formas comunales de la vida política es de ahí de donde nacieron nociones este, fuertemente innovativas como la de autonomía y Estado plurinacional, que recorre el nuevo lenguaje político este, latinoamericano. Y los derechos constitucionales que vienen asociados a estas, sin duda se nutren de la idea de autonomía y Estado plurinacional. Y la segunda, sin duda, remite ante el cercamiento y secuestro cada vez mayor de lo común, ante el hecho capitalista en su fase de desposesión y mercantilización, vemos emerger cada vez más espacios de comunidad y formas de sociabilidad que podríamos denominar al estilo de Boaventura de Sousa Santos como campos de experimentación más allá del Estado y más allá del mercado. Ese etos comunal es potencialmente radical, no es siempre radical, es potencialmente radical, y con esto termino, y en América Latina hay distintas ilustraciones ¿no? del mismo, las formas de economía solidaria o social que vienen desarrollando en cooperativas de construcción, en este, cooperativas de trabajadores de fábricas recuperadas, este, en espacios ligados a las mujeres, a los trabajadores desocupados, son distintas formas de economía social ligadas sobre todo a los excluidos del modelo, pero que plantean o que colocan en el centro una economía de la vida, que colocan en el centro la reproducción de los medios de vida y a veces sin quererlo crean nuevos lazos comunitarios que son altamente disruptivos en el marco este, del capitalismo. Lo que sucede es que también el Estado siempre busca tutelar esas experiencias y esas experiencias son pequeñas, acotadas, modestas y siempre vulnerables, con lo cual efectivamente este, pueden ser cooptadas este, por el Estado. Hay también emergencia de espacios educacionales muy interesantes, este, autoorganizados, ligados muchos a movimientos sociales. Pienso en universidades que han creado los distintos movimientos sociales, pienso en, los movimientos, en el movimiento sin tierra, que en eso ha, ha, dado, ha hecho escuela este, en el espacio de, este, educativo, pero numerosos son los movimientos sociales en América Latina que buscan problematizar la idea de la educación y plantean un proyecto pedagógico, político, también disruptivo, tratando de hacer conjugar autonomía y territorio. Y por supuesto, lo último, por supuesto, este, eh, las mujeres, el rol de las mujeres, que es absolutamente central en las luchas que hoy se llevan, y las que se llevaban antes también, en América Latina, en tanto y en cuanto son las mujeres las que colocan en el centro la vida y no la acumulación a través de una ética del cuidado que se basa en valores como la reciprocidad, la complementariedad y la cooperación. El etos comunal pone en el centro el valor vida, 
los valores de uso. Y aparece ilustrado por un montón de experiencias que supongo serán este, presentadas en estos días. Pero en términos de Gramsci, en términos de Gramsci, cuando hablamos de etos comunal, también hablamos de praxis prefigurativa. Es decir, en definitiva, lo que estamos tratando de detectar ahí es, este, o de proyectar ahí, son las nuevas relaciones sociales propias de una sociedad del futuro, en la cual se contemplan creación colectiva y socialización de saberes. Agradezco, se acabó mi tiempo. Muchas gracias por la paciencia. Thanks a lot, uh, Maristella. Um, I found this very interesting that there are two processes going on at the same time. One is this need for formulating a vision of the commons as something that is a common future. And also at the same time, uh, there is still a process going on, which I think uh, David Harvey was mentioned, which in Marxist terms would be called primitive accumulation. Um, as I already announced, uh, the purpose uh, of this is now directly for you to ask questions or to make comments. And I will only talk as long as I don't see any hands rise up. So maybe um, you can stop me and shut me down. Or um, What I also found very interesting are these new relations with nature that uh, in a sort of old-fashioned environmentalist concept, nature was still envisioned in a very typically European way as this lifeless nature. And now we're becoming in, entering a paradigm where nature becomes more networked, where nature becomes more like Marcuse said, what would happen if nature opens its eyes? And that's in these discourses also with what you mentioned with Latour and uh, these concepts of a different type of uh, more horizontal understandings and networks. And I think that's also part of this change in discourse where new possibilities arise if uh, natural entities get certain legal status and then that can be used also in political struggles so that nature in a way gets much more politicized. And here we have a question. Yes. Is there somebody? Is there somebody? He's coming. Yes. Okay. Um, a question to Maristella. Could you say a little bit more about uh, whether the governments are doing something to support, for example, solidarity and, and social economy? Because uh, the Brazilian government, for example, is supporting the mapping of solidarity and, so and solidar uh, social economy initiatives. And uh, is, is that a strong support? And is that helping... Is there some more positive relationship between governments and these things than just the extractivist paradigm? No, you answer directly. Ah, okay. Yeah. Hola. Oh. <laughs> bueno, sobre la economía social y solidaria... Eh, son varios los gobiernos que han intervenido este, de manera activa, gobiernos progresistas, este, para eh, promover la economía solidaria, este, no solo Brasil, también en Argentina, inclusive Paraguay y este, Venezuela. Hoy conversábamos eso precisamente con mi colega Edgardo Lander. Este, lo que sucede es que las economías, eh, perdón, las experiencias de economía social en general tienen una relación muy ambigua con este, el Estado. Requieren del mismo este, para poder, en ese sentido, este, desarrollarse, pero el Estado siempre busca, a través de mapeo, la ayuda económica, eh, el control sobre las mismas. Es decir, el Estado necesita tutelar esas este, economías que lo que planteaban originariamente eran una autonomía este, eh, o una visión eh, diferente también de las relaciones capitalistas. También hay que decir en ese sentido que la mayor parte de las experiencias ligadas a la economía social o solidaria en América Latina tienen que ver con la autoexplotación, con el autoempleo, es decir, con una necesidad básica ¿no? 
que este, en ese sentido este, es, eh, digamos, este, no plantea en sí misma eh, una, un horizonte utópico, sino que tiene que ver con este, las eh, necesidades este, básicas. Sin embargo, eh, esto para decir que efectivamente hay una serie de experiencias muy heterogéneas en toda América Latina. Pero para contestar la pregunta puntual, creo que es interesante que los gobiernos progresistas se hayan interesado y que fomenten la economía solidaria. Me olvidaba que en el caso de Ecuador aparece como central dentro del proyecto de gobierno. Sin embargo, el riesgo mayor es que al tutelarlas, este, estas pierdan toda su riqueza original y su potencialidad este, disruptiva. Uh, maybe uh, Stefano wanted no, no, to make a comment. Okay. So um, uh, the, I would like the friend with the uh, Frank Tapa haircut, please. <laughs> Thanks, Armin. I must admit I was emotioned to see you presenting uh, Stefano Rodotà. Uh, I am an Italian uh, migrant since 15 years, and uh, the, my president is sitting there, so... <laughs> Thanks for uh, trying your best. And um, my question to, uh, to Rodotà is uh, whether the situation in Italy is, um, can be recuperated. Because we have been through um, a process uh, that has involved uh, the capital, the media. And nowadays, media is uh, the best tool to actually constitute networks of trust. We have seen... We have gone through 20 years in which powers have reorganized themselves around the, uh, supporting themselves in the same position and same um, structure. The commons have been predated and it's very hard to start anew. So what, is, uh, what would have been or what is your vision for actually um, recuperating or... Uh, Uh, better restoring some kind of uh, uh, situation in which neutrality would be at least an utopia, in which uh, we could actually rebuild networks of trust and start talking again politics in Italy. Thank you. Oh, I cannot answer uh, in its totality this question. I would like to say, to make... Two remarks. First of all, if I am looking to what to the uh, official politics, I must be pessimistic. If I look to the society, I must be optimistic. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think that in this year, in the past years, we had some important processes making empowering people and people are now interested in giving themselves the opportunity to intervene in the public affairs there is a, a new idea of citizenship not passivity this is very difficult uh, the, the question is It's possible to give citizens this opportunity to improve their possibility to influence the politics and to have a role in the dimension of the commons. So I think that we must follow what is happening in Italy from the point of view of not only specific initiative, but if it is possible to build up networks of groups, persons, organizations looking at the commons perspective. This is one of the main, in my opinion, in my mind, one of the main political issues nowadays in Italy. We have this possibility. This possibility, and uh, uh, I am pessimistic from another point of view. There is an history of the left into, in Italy, and not only. Uh, 
an history of fragmentation, an history of separation. And I am, uh, I would like, and, and I hope that this logic cannot be transmitted, exported in the realm of the commons, where people are much more interested in exploiting their own opportunity, local, cultural, and so on, than to have a networked action inside the society. This is, in this very moment, the problem. Uh, I see that we have on, the, on one side an enormous power of traditional politics directly connected with the traditional uh, management of the economy, truly against the idea of commons. There is in this very I made, I made the reference to the referendum, 27 million people, but there is an unrelenting battle, struggle for making the result of the referendum effective. And there are in this very moment many people working on this point. They are, in, in, for instance, proclaiming the civil obedience, not the civil disobedience. Be, for instance, the referendum decided that the exploitation of the of the water the, of, uh, water services cannot give profit. People are now in some uh, municipalities not paying the the tariff. They pay the tariff excluding the part of the profit. So I think that we are in this very moment inventing and there is an, 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 there are enormous opportunities but it is very difficult to have the political parties, the official movements supporting this kind of uh, initiative, social and networking initiatives. There was somebody behind there earlier in this, side, in this section, a woman, I think, further back on this side. No? Yes, please. Okay. Yep. So I have a, thank you. I have a question for both of you. Um, what would you say is the weakest link in, in the legal chain that is actively standing in the way of us achieving some kind of um, permanence of access to the commons and building commons? And where would you advise younger people to push together? Maristel? <risa> Desde, no es este, no es fácil responder a, a esa pregunta porque eh, en un escenario como el latinoamericano los movimientos sociales han hecho un gran esfuerzo un gran esfuerzo por incorporar el lenguaje de las instituciones y apostar por ejemplo, a la creación de una nueva institucionalidad. Puede ser una nueva institucionalidad ambiental, como aparece en la Constitución ecuatoriana, pero también en la Constitución boliviana, donde hay una serie de derechos colectivos ¿no? este, importantes que antes se negaban a los pueblos indígenas. ¿no? Ese proceso de constitucionalización de los derechos colectivos fue importante. Eh, ha habido también este, referéndums, leyes, leyes eh, importantes respecto o que dan cuenta de una nueva institucionalidad ambiental. Pienso en el caso de Argentina y este, nos tocó con otros amigos, colegas y activistas estar ahí. Este, se sancionó hace tres años una ley nacional de protección de los glaciares que prohíbe en la zona de glaciares y periglaciares distintas actividades extractivas. 
entre ellas petróleo, minería, etc. Es decir, hay digamos, una apertura y, y los movimientos sociales apuestan a una este, nueva frontera de derechos, pero en realidad después lo que encontramos es que hay una gran distancia entre este, la posibilidad de que efectivamente esos derechos constitucionales y esas leyes sancionadas y esos referéndums aprobados tengan un correlato concreto en la realidad, lo cual genera una gran desmovilización, un gran desasosiego, un gran este, pesimismo, sobre todo en aquellos sectores movilizados, y sobre todo alimenta el discurso de que la ley no sirve para nada, de que la ley tiene pasos cortos, que la ley sigue siendo un instrumento en manos de los poderosos. Entonces, en ese, en ese lugar eh, ambivalente, creo, nos colocamos, o este, se puede colocar, sobre todo, creo yo, este, eh, la gente que hoy lucha por la expansión de, de las fronteras de derecho, sabiendo aún que esos derechos no son sino a medias reconocidos y que es necesario efectivamente seguir, digamos, impulsando la lucha para que esto se concrete realmente en una nueva este, institucionalidad. Siempre hay contradicciones este, en, en, en ese sentido y me temo que no hay una receta para darle este, a, la, a la juventud, pero sí la necesidad de pensar que no es solo con acciones directas, sino que es con acciones institucionales también que efectivamente se logra un cambio en la correlación de fuerzas sociales y es posible pensar también en un horizonte este, emancipatorio. Just a short remark looking at the Italian situation. What is now happening is a, this is important cultural and political result that there is a movement, a work, a collective work, trying to reinterpret, re, uh, re, making reference to the Constitution in a way which can assume the reference to the new perspective of commons. The, the, the idea of commons was, was completely out the perspective of the people who were writing the Constitution. Uh, and, but there are some rules written, for instance, in the perspective of nationalization that can now be reconsidered, making reference to the fact that this rule, this article of the Constitution, allows community of workers and uh, uh, users to manage directly public services. So we can found inside the Constitution, built up around the traditional distinction between public and private property, a third dimension directly related to what today we call commons. Second, there is a long tradition starting from the Weimar Constitution about the social function of property. What is now social function of the property? Only the power of the state to intervene and to limit the power of the owner or there is another way to manage property, giving opportunity and giving voice to all subjects involved directly or indirectly in the use of a good. So I think that this is a process. And second, this is a process encountering a new interest of the young generation toward the Constitution. So there is a complex process, and I, I am not optimistic or pessimistic. I think that we must, I say must, work in this direction. Who was first? <laughs> I think um, here.
Pois eu tenho uma intervenção, bom, bueno, uma pergunta a Stefano e também a Maristela. E a Stefano, em especial, ah, me gostaria de compartilhar uma preocupação e também conhecer a tua opinião sobre as possibilidades de unir o discurso de los bienes comunes, el debate de los bienes comunes como patrimonio de la humanidad, como derechos de los seres humanos, que es innegable, tenemos derecho al agua, tenemos derecho a la tierra, tenemos todos los derechos en, en los cuales se incluyen los comunes, con el otro debate, el otro discurso, las otras luchas de los movimientos populares del sur, de las culturas del sur, y me refiero a las culturas indígenas, afrodescendentes, a las subculturas que considera el agua, el cerro, el bosque, como, uh, no como un patrimonio de la humanidad, no como un bien común, sino como seres, en muchos casos, animados. El río tiene su alma, el bosque tiene su espíritu, las plantas con propiedades medicinales son veneradas, es decir, son culturas que comprenden lo que nosotras y nosotros es una cultura, una perspectiva cartesiana que nos ha distanciado de la naturaleza, los comprendemos a fin de cuentas como bienes. Y que si podemos ir más profundamente, corremos el riesgo en nuestro discurso, obviamente muy positivo de los comunes, nada más cambiar un concepto de recurso, agua, se transforma en un bien. Es decir, hay un puente entre nuestro discurso uh, más eurocentrista, digamos así, con los discursos de los pueblos originarios, afrodescendentes y las, sub y las subculturas del sur, que no los perciben como a servicio de los seres humanos, sino que existen independientemente de los seres humanos. Es decir, ¿qué puentes teóricos o debates o, ac o acciones podríamos construir? Essa é uma preocupação e uma dúvida, e me gostaria de conhecer a tua opinião. E para a Maristela, a, a mim também me gostaria de compartilhar minha preocupação com respeito à ética do cuidado, vista desde o movimento feminista. As mulheres hemos estado lutando muitíssimos anos para romper a ideia de que vamos agora educar os varões para que não haja violência. Nós somos as educadoras. Luego nos convertemos en las salvadoras del planeta. No vamos, igual que limpiamos la casa, igual que salvamos la casa, ahora vamos a cuidar del planeta, vamos a salvar el planeta. ¿Qué tanto la perspectiva de la ética del cuidado aplicada, digamos, tomando el papel de las mujeres en, en debate, en las prácticas de los comunes desde América Latina, no corre el riesgo de nuevamente estar reforzando estos roles que durante décadas hemos intentado romper con ellos. ¿no? Y también tomando en cuenta que a nivel de América Latina, de manera general, no específica, o sea, sé que existen casos uh, diferentes, pero las mujeres nunca hemos estado incluidas Thanks en lo comunal. Ok, eso. Um, Maybe a very brief statement that yeah. we are running out of time. Maybe a brief reply. Yes. Very briefly. Uh, it's true. When we are looking to some goods in brackets, we must uh, reflect about the wording. When we look at the nature, the transformation of nature in goods reflects another kind of wording. So we must not only work on the legal or social uh, in, uh, dimension, but also because the word are a, only a performative uh, force. So it's true, and uh, they are very different <coughs> meaning when you when we are using the word good in different cultures for the problem of the of the uh, heritage of humanity uh, of the manca mankind this is a complex problem because we have some treaties like the treaties on antarctic on the sea on the extra atmospheric space looking at 
these goods or space or dimension in the perspective not of the common, but in, we can also say we are entering the perspective of common. The first step and the aim is that these goods are not are outside the market and not subject to the sovereignty. So they cannot be appropriated from the point of view of the market and from the view of politics. They are also other perspectives. If you look at UNESCO declaration on the uh, uh, goods uh, uh, pertaining the humanity. Third, <coughs> if you look to another dimension, the, the, the body dimension, if you look to the uh, declaration of UNESCO on genome, there is said that human genome in a symbolic sense is uh, is i don't patrimonio the patrimony patrimony of the humanity but in this case it does not mean that human genome becomes a common simply there is a barrier against the possibility of appropriation through patents and so on. If you look at Article 3 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of European Union, you can uh, discover that there is said that the body and these parts cannot be source of profit. So I think that we have to look to this perspective, but we need distinction. Sí, este, eh, coincido aquí con, el, con Estefano Rodotá sobre eh, la cuestión que uno debe leer eh, también el, el, el bien común en términos o en clave de desmercantilización, desmercantilización este, de los bienes naturales y en ese sentido insisto que eh, sobre todo eh, eh, en los procesos de lucha hoy existentes eh, la noción misma de territorialidad es un, alcan es un concepto de alcance intermedio que nos permite pensar el anclaje local de esos bienes desmercantilizados, no como patrimonio de la humanidad, sino en términos de territorio heredado, territorio elegido, territorio originario, que debe leerse este, en clave local y como punto de partida de creación de ámbitos de eh, comunidad. Eh, perdón, pero quería agregar esa cuestión. Y respecto de eh, la ética del cuidado, eh, es, es verdad que efectivamente... Eh, hay que utilizar el concepto este, en ese sentido eh, de manera, sin, ser, sin, sin abundar, este, sin ser engorrosa, de manera cuidadosa, porque efectivamente eh, la perspectiva de que la mujer eh, ocupa un rol fundamental en las luchas sociales y sobre todo en las luchas socioambientales ha servido para una reesencialización, digamos, del rol de la mujer equiparándola a la naturaleza. Lo mismo ha sucedido con los pueblos originarios, Parecía que los pueblos originarios, por un lado, y por otro lado, las mujeres, están llamados a ser los grandes salvadores de la este, Pachamama o de la Madre Tierra. Y, y esto no es así. Sin embargo, son actores, son actores centrales en los procesos de lucha y eso hay que explicarlo, digamos, efectivamente, ese rol que tienen. Y en ese sentido sí tiene que ver con los valores que ellos mismos promueven en este, eh, el desarrollo de una cultura oh, este, que apunta sobre todo a la vida y no a la acumulación. Así que yo sería muy cuidadoso, hay visiones ecofeministas que sobre todo ponen el acento en el paralelismo que hay entre la explotación de la naturaleza en su, visión, este, su versión instrumental y la explotación de la mujer, este, que en todo caso sirven también para sacarnos de esa mirada más esencialista sobre el rol de la mujer. Pero lo esencial es que efectivamente hay una serie de valores comunales este, centrales que son eh, proyectados por este, la mujer y que son también, en todo caso, este, asociados a eh, la cosmovisión de los pueblos indígenas. 
just a clarification. What I said is that we have a tradition and we have some efforts to put some goods outside the market. But the fact that some goods are legally uh, considered outside the market does, does not imply immediately that they become common goods. This is a, an important point for analyzing rightly what is happening in this very moment. We are unfortunately running terribly over time. I think there are lots more questions. I hope we will have time and spaces for discussing those questions. At this point, before everybody runs out, I would like to say also a very big thanks to translators who have already been working very hard. And yeah. <laughs> so thank you, and we will meet in 30 minutes again for the next session.